they're not already here. And so I'm just gonna welcome everybody. Hello, it is so great to be doing this tonight. Um, we have the esteemed David Suzuki with us. David needs no introduction. Um, I'm Linda Solomon Wood. I'm editor in chief of Canada's National Observer. And um, we, National Observer really exists for the goal of keeping climate in the conversation, but we also report on politics, social issues, and disinformation. And lately, we are focused almost 100% on public health. Um, David, thank you so much for joining me tonight of the first Zoom with National Observer. Um, or as my friend Andy Wright called it in an earlier email today, no TV. Um, and I just wanted you to know that there were 1,200 people who wanted to be on this call tonight. So I'm not sure how many actually will be on because a lot were from Eastern Canada as well and it's late for them. So guys, if you are here from Eastern Canada, way to go. And we're gonna try to keep you awake for the next hour. Um, a lot of you have sent in questions for me to ask David. We'll get to those in a little bit. Um, our program tonight's gonna be an hour, half hour of discussion between David and I and then over to you guys. Um, at the end of the hour, we're gonna ask you to fill out a poll, you'll see it. And um, yeah, so let's get right into it. So it's Thursday, April 16th, and we're in the midst of the pandemic. And we're all going on about a month of isolation now. Restaurants are shuttered, airplanes are grounded, 22 million Americans have filed for jobless claims, 2.2 million Canadians are out of work, um, those of us that are lucky enough to still have jobs are working from home. And the International Monetary Fund is warning that we very well may be headed for a depression. And COVID-19 is ending thousands of lives and destroying many more livelihoods. The New York Times had a headline this morning that said it's the end of the world economy as we know it. And so David, in that, with all of that context, um, what would you like to say to Canadians tonight? Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me here. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a paid, uh, a paid consultant for you, but let me say to the audience that uh, every day I get up and I tune into the National Observer and thank God that you're there. And uh, I really have depended on, on you to provide the kind of coverage that gives heart to those of us that are in the trenches uh, fighting various aspects of the environmental, uh, the environmental crisis. So th thank you very much for what you're doing and thank you for asking me to be part of this. This is an amazing moment in time. One of the things that uh, we've been marveling at today, we're at our, well, I call it a cabin, but it's really a shack on, <laughs> uh, on an island. The Gulf, we got stranded here by accident, we got here for a long weekend with our daughters and suddenly there was a lockdown. And as I told you, I only had three days worth of knickers with me and I'm stuck here. But uh, I was looking up in the sky today, it was filled with geese. I've never seen anything like that since I filmed geese in the uh, Delta in Winnipeg many years ago. But the skies have just been filled with birds we've had uh, pods of killer whales coming through and I have oh. the sense that Mother Earth is saying thank God you know these busy people are giving me a break and I hope that people who live in places like Shanghai and Beijing in uh, Delhi or, or Bombay are looking up and seeing what it can be like when air is the way it should be invisible and odorless. So this moment that is really, I would like to think is at the end of the way we've been going since the end of World War II. We've been living it up as if there was no tomorrow. Well, now we better start thinking about it because tomorrow is coming and it's not looking very good. So this is a pause, a moment, difficult. I mean, Linda, you and I, you know, we, we can manage, we have the, the resources and the, 
finances to to live this out. But I I think of people, uh, you know, single parents shut in tiny apartments. I think of the elders in elder care homes. Uh, I think of people in prisons. Um, I I think of uh, uh, well, I think of all of the uh, workers on the front line working to let us continue on and. This is a very, very tough time. But it's a time, I think, when we can discover community. You know, Al Gore always says the Chinese word or symbol for crisis is made of two parts, danger and opportunity. And I think it's absolutely right. We face this crisis uh, of COVID, which is one of many crises, but it's a huge opportunity now to say, what the hell have we done wrong that got us into this mess. And how do we go about now getting out of it? It's no longer trying to get back up the way everything was before the crisis. In 28, we missed a golden chance when the banks created the crisis. And, you know, not one North American banker went to, went to jail, for God's sakes. That was a huge opportunity to, to get things uh, off on a different track, and we didn't. Well, this is another call. And I think that, uh, you know, we've got to tough it out. It's going to take much more than a few more weeks. I would say, personally, I th think we'll be lucky to get out of this crisis within a year. And that will be when we, we finally get a vaccine. But well, people will begin to trickle back into work. And we're just going to have the, the, uh, the virus. My God, I'm looking out here. I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> I'm seeing salmon out there feeding. Oh, wow. Sorry. Do you want to show us? Do you yeah, want to show I, no, us? No, I want to shout to my son-in-law. <laughs> so I hope that everybody is able to hear us okay. And um, I'd love to know from you guys where you are if you want to text in the side there while David is going to tell his son that the salmon are out in the water. I think he's on Quadra Island. Um, so the Sorry. next question, I, that's okay. The next question, David, that I have for you is, you know, people are talking about a new economy. And I think a lot of our readers have, well, a lot of people have been writing in and saying, you know, I hope that you guys will write about and start talking about, like, what are the ways we could move into a new economy now like let's don't go back to the old let's move into an economy that um you know that looks different from the one that's falling apart right now and i think as we were talking um before we started you know i was just saying that a lot of people expected this falling apart to happen from climate change but it's upon us now so how is this connected in your mind and like can we follow up like like how are we going to get through this and then deal as well with climate change? Yeah, well, I think that the, uh, you know, we're being driven now by basically a corporate agenda. And the economy has come to have the highest uh, position in our society. And we, um, we saw it under the years of uh, Mr. Harper, when over and over again, he said, look, we can't deal with climate change. That's crazy economics. Doing something to reduce our emissions will destroy the economy. So in saying that, he elevated the economy <coughs> above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. And that just doesn't make any sense. So let me explain to your audience a story that I think illustrates what we have to do with the economy. I got a call four or five years ago now from the CEO of one of the largest companies in the tar sands in Alberta. Can I come and talk to you? I said, of course. I'm not into fighting. I'd be honored to have you come in and talk to me. The next day, he showed up at my door at my office. And I told him how honored I was and how thrilled and thank you and all that. And I said, but before you come into my office, I want you to do me a big favor. I want you to leave your identity outside this door. I want to meet you as one human being to another. And I want to talk about what is our common ground. If we don't agree on a common foundation of the way we live, 
what's the point of talking about top pipelines and the, the price of oil and emission reduction and all that? What's the point of that if we don't agree in the beginning? Well, he was quite shocked and was really reluctant, but he was a good man. And so he came into my office. I could see in his eyes that this made him very uncomfortable. So I said, look, let me explain what I mean. I said, we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. And we can't do anything about that. We have to live within them. I said, physics tells us you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. The law of gravity says if I trip, I'm going to fall to the ground. The first and second law of thermodynamics tell us you can't build a perpetual motion machine. We understand that. That's dictated by the, the universe we live in, and we live within those constraints. In chemistry, it's the same. The atomic properties of the elements determine melting point, freezing point, boiling point, reaction rates, diffusion constants. Those laws tell you what kind of molecules you can make and what you can't. And we live within that. And in biology, it's the same. Biology tells us every species of plant and animal has a maximum number that can be achieved. And if you exceed that number, their population will crash. And that's determined by what's called the carrying capacity of their, of their, of their uh, ecosystem. And I, then I said, you and I are animals. Now I can see right away he did not like that. I said, we're animals. You know, I remember I went to Austin, Texas to give a lecture years ago, first annual meeting of Green Building Association. There were 3,000 people, a lot of children. And I said to the kids, now, kids, if you remember one thing from my lecture, remember we are animals. Man, did their parents get pissed off at me. This woman came up and said, don't you call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. I said, madam, I'm a biologist. If your daughter isn't an animal, is she a plant? Like, <laughs> we are animals. And as animals, I said, what is the most important thing every human being needs? And instead of giving me the answer any child would say, he went, well, uh, and I could see he's thinking a job, a money. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. <laughs> if you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So will you agree with me that clean air is a sacred gift from nature and that in receiving it, you and I have an obligation to care for that air because it not only keeps us alive, it's all of the terrestrial beings on the planet. So clean air has got to be a fundamental need and responsibility. Then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water by weight. We're basically a big blob of water. We don't, you know, if uh, we've got enough organic thickeners so we don't dribble away on the floor, but it leaks out of our eyes and our mouth and our skin and our crotch. And I said, if you don't have water, you've got to drink water. If you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you breathe contaminated water, you're sick. So doesn't clean water join clean air? as a sacred gift from nature. And we have a responsibility to protect it. And then I said, you know, we can go a lot longer without food, but four to six weeks without food, you're gonna die. Most of it comes from the soil. So clean soil and food. So I know I'm so going on it, kind of long. Well, well, I wanted to try to guide you back to the thing about like, so what you're saying is, you know, these are the fundamental things we need to live. and in terms of how we're gonna go forward out of this COVID-19 thing and deal with climate change. Like, is that really what you're saying? Like, we've just gotta keep those I'm things. Saying it doesn't make sense that these fundamental things are not the foundation on which we build our lives. Those are dictated by laws of nature. We have to live within those constraints. I said, other things, the economy is not a law of nature, and yet we treat the economy, oh my God, the economy is not looking good, as if it's a thing. It's a human construct, for God's sake. So it, it, if it doesn't work or something's wrong, we can change it. You can't change laws of nature. So 
you know, so if you David, have an economy that based yeah, and so like if you were if you were gonna say something to if you what would you ask Justin Trudeau? What would you say, Justin Trudeau? Here's what you should do right now. Here's the moment you can grasp it. Grasp it and <laughs> I've already uh, uh I've stopped um talking to Justin. He's been very good in the uh in the COVID crisis, I think. Canada's, uh, uh, you know, trying to do the best they can in this unprecedented yeah. situation. Yeah. But I was talking to him before uh, the crisis came up. Yeah. And after he came back from Paris in, in 2015, I said, you know, you set a very hard target. You signed that deal. You set a hard target. Are you serious? He answered me immediately and said, I'm very serious. So we praised him. We celebrated Canada's back, blah, blah, blah. Then he bought a pipeline and I emailed him and I said, look, <coughs> what the hell? This doesn't make any sense. I said, you have young children. What you have just done is going to reverberate through the lives of your children. Why did you run for office to get elected if it isn't to try to protect the future for your own children? And you know what his response to me was? He doesn't answer me anymore. So I understand that. He has to play the game of politics so that even the future for his own children, if he understands what climate change is all about, which he says he does, that that has to come second to the political reality that his highest priority is getting reelected. So politics itself, you know, they have to respond to something like the COVID crisis, but you look at Canada's performance ever since 1988, when scientists meeting in Toronto said, this is a crisis that is second only to all out nuclear war. And they called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. If they had done it, we wouldn't have the crisis we have today. Canada said, oh, we got to do something that we went, then went to Rio in 1992. In Rio, it had been watered down because George Bush, H.W. Bush, said, I'm not going to come unless you water that thing down. So in Rio in 1992, they said, we've got to stabilize 1990 levels by the year 2000. We signed that. We didn't do a damn thing. We went to Kyoto in 1997. We said we will reduce emissions by 5 to 6 percent below 1990 levels by 2010. We signed Kyoto. We are the only country that pulled out of Kyoto uh, in 2008 under Harper. So these political commitments over a long time, you know, after Trudeau's uh, um, uh, Minister of the Environment, our new Minister of the Environment came back, his whole thing was uh, carbon neutral by 2050. You know, this, we're gonna be carbon neutral. Politicians love that. Not one politician in office right now is going to be in office in 2050. So who's accountable when they never don't hit their targets? Who's accountable for all of the agreements that we signed in 1992, in 1997, in 2015? Who's accountable for that? So the political system cannot deal with it unless civil society rises up and bloody well demands that they do it. Then they will jump on board. That brings up a really interesting question in terms of where we are now, you know, civil society rising up and demanding how, like, how can we do that in the current environment? Like, what should citizens be doing now to help we, the push things in that direction? We can't. And, uh, you know, right now we, we're going to have to get our way through so that people can get back to doing something and, and you know, uh, encountering other people. I haven't met another human being than my family for five weeks. Uh, well, so we, we're going to have to go through this. You know, the only thing I can say to your, your listeners is uh, if you haven't read the book, The Hot Zone by Richard uh, oh, Preston, Richard Preston, and it uh -huh. came out shortly after the Ebola crisis first uh, broke out. Uh -huh. It is a riveting book. Like it's a nail biter. Every chapter, I, it was well, just the scariest thing. And in the yeah. last, the last chapter blew me away. He said, "You know, these new viruses come out, 
because animal, uh, viruses exchange from animals, from birds to whatever, you know, you get the, right. the swine flu and, and all of that. And he right. said, as we deplete the pristine areas, as we cut down forests, we yeah. force animals together that never normally come uh, into contact. Right. So right. these things are going to keep jumping out. So the, yeah. you know, you look at the, 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 this cor coronavirus and they think it came from bats and pangolins. I'll bet you half your audience has never heard of a pangolin. It's an endangered animal. They're an amazing animal, a kind of anteater. But bats to pangolins to humans, like, that's incredible. And we've got to David, get nature. I am seeing down at the bottom of my screen that we have like 75 questions. Um, I am not sure how to open them up, but I'd like to give people a chance to, um, can, just one moment, please. Can you tell me how to open the Q&A? Well, some, okay. So here's a question. Janelle, who is this from? Is this from Brenda? I too was told that my local, by my local MP, that the economy was more important than the climate crisis. She pointed to Doug Ford and the conservative supporters as a reason why the liberals could not go further with environmental policies. Do you think that the COVID-19 crisis will have moved the liberal party's idea of what is possible? This is from Alan Derbez. Thank you, Alan. Well, as I say, I think the problem is that politics uh, is constrained by the, the laws of re-election. They got to get re-elected and that's their, their highest priority. So whatever they do has to pay off before the next election. Dealing with climate, we don't have the time. Uh, we, we, we can't do everything in an election er period. If we're talking now uh, at least a dozen years to make major, major changes. And uh, uh, we've got to get on with it. And I think it's only if the public demands it that it will be done by politicians. When Al Gore became vice president, I called him. He was a friend of mine. And I said, Al, this is great. What do, can people like me do to help you? And he said, don't look to people like me. He said, if you want change, you've got to convince the public this is important. Show them that there are solutions and get them to demand action. Then he said, everybody will jump on the bandwagon. So I yeah. think the only option really is if we have massive civil society, 500,000 people marched in Montreal behind Greta, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. What was it 40,000 or 120,000 in Vancouver marched? Now, damn it all, if that isn't a demonstration, politicians right. will pay attention to it. But now we're going to have to wait for the recovery from this to really get on with that. People's attention is focused on the, uh, the immediate things. Yes. Uh, I think the lesson, the lesson we get is look at what the government is doing with this crisis. They're doing things that were inconceivable six months ago. Look at the money that they're putting into this. If they had put a fraction of that money and effort into dealing with climate change we wouldn't be in the crisis that we're in there and this is really interesting because we didn't demand they do this they did it because they looked at the facts they read the science and they went oh my god we've got to do all this right well this, uh, yes the science was in but i i would say if it wasn't for a lot of people greta greta i mean we, about shutting down the country for COVID 19. oh uh, that they got guidance, I think, from what China did and, and whatever else. But, you know, you see the foot dragging. They're very reluctant to do something heroic. And if you look at Sweden, they've taken a very, very different approach, which is right gone through. But I suspect they have social services and they have the medical services to, to deal with what's coming for them. We don't. Right, right, right. But David, we have the, some more questions. If you, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm going on way too long with my answers. <laughs> I'll make them much briefer, sorry. Okay, so um, we have a question from Ian Thieker. Do either of you, Linda or David, see the federal liberals as likely to introduce a real climate change plan, like a, new, a Green New Deal? 
that could get us to our Paris 1.5 commitment. How about the NDP? I think it was a mistake for, uh, for those of us that were pushing for a, a Green New Deal, and I support that movement very much to try to get the NDP to accept it uh, before the last election, because it immediately was seen as a political move. We, it doesn't make sense, you know, and I've said this to the Green Party members, although I'm now campaigning for them, that it doesn't make sense to have a political party that represents the environment, cares for the environment, and then the other parties can ignore it. That's just crazy. So yeah. to get something with the Green New Deal, it's in a time, you know, if we can come out of this crisis with, as Elizabeth May has been saying, a degree of cooperation that she's never seen before, if we can carry that on after this crisis, passes, then I think there might be a real opportunity. Um, this And with uh, the NDP or the Liberals, maybe them coming together. That Well, I would hope all of them, but... Uh, yeah, I would hope so too. I would hope so too. We have another question from Rosa Galvez, who says, I am a senator. I don't need to be reelected. I'll be at the Senate for 20 years. I just joined the National Finance Committee to exercise oversight over COVID-19 measures. I want to push for a just transition to decarbonization and not a restart of business as usual. What about civil society groups on each province write to their premiers and to Trudeau asking for this just transition? Can you help with this? I gave a lecture in parliament to the, uh, to the Senate. I was disappointed in how few there were. Serge Royal, Joel, had a two-day conference in which he brought all kinds of people in to talk about Canada and where to go in the future. And I pointed out in my lecture, which you can find, it's been published, saying the problem with political uh, politicians is that they are constrained by that terrible reality of looking from one election to the next. And I said, the one group that we have that is not subject to that are senators. They're not elected. They don't have to worry about that. They are people who are supposed to give a sober second thought. So how about sober second thought that goes to the next generation? They can provide that. So I'm thrilled. So Rosa wants online. to lead that. Yeah. She's and online. She asked me. If, if, and I, I think senators, please, Push it. There are senators who I know would be very uh, supportive, supportive of the idea, and I think civil society would come behind you and support you. But you don't need civil society. You've got an appointment for life. So. And David, I just want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but she asked you very directly, will you help us? Sure, of course. I don't know what she's Great. asking, but... <laughs> Well, maybe um, she could follow up with you or, or me absolutely. on that. But absolutely, yeah. she should Wonderful. look up the speech I already gave to the Senate. Okay, now we have another question from Desi Parento, who says, "Myself and my husband are from Fishing Lake, Matee settlement in Alberta. We are wondering what effect or outcome you see for our indigenous communities with this virus." Well. I have two Haida grandsons, and I and they're they're on Haida Gwaii right now, and I know their grandparents are absolutely terrified because, of course, their uh, elders tell stories of the great smallpox epidemic that wiped out ninety percent of Haida in two years. I mean, can you imagine what a catastrophic? I mean, it's a miracle to me that they survived. They're trying to lock down the islands completely, but I know that there's a contaminant that's already entered uh, Haida Gwaii. But for indigenous communities, there is that collective memory of what the first encounter with Europeans did to them in terms of diseases. But also these isolated communities simply don't have the resources. If this thing spreads in any way, they don't have the resources. They won't be able to medevac them uh, all of them out. So it's a very, it's a terrifying uh, situation for Indigenous communities. Well, I hope you stay well, and I hope everyone on the call stays well. Um, and, 
you know, I wanted to say that at the outset. It's wonderful to be together like this, even virtually, and I'm just hoping for everybody's health and safety. Um, we have a question from Joanne Mulhern. What is the one campaign or demand that we should work for now or after the pandemic is over? Well, we have to act at least, I've heard the use of the war metaphor for the fight against the virus. Mm -hmm. But I've always said that we ought to be engaged as if we were at war mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, a wonderful book that Seth Klein is bringing out in September, which is mm -hmm. to look at what was actually achieved in World War II after Pearl Harbor. I mean, I mm -hmm. think there was something like 26 or 28, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, crown corporations that were mm -hmm. established to go out and do their thing. I mean, you see mm -hmm. the recruitment of women in the workforce, uh, all kinds of uh, activities started to pump out guns and tanks and planes and, and ships in a very short period of time because the commitment was made to win the war. And that's what we need in terms of climate crisis to recognize this is the existential you know, crisis of our time. And once you commit to saying, this has got to be the target, the IPCC has given us that target, then get on with it and, and throw everything behind. There are huge opportunities that come then. You know, in Alberta, we, we've got all of these thousands of orphan wells that are leaking methane into the atmosphere. Recruit people with the, with the skills from the tar sands to begin to, to plug these and get society working on rewilding the planet and to creating a livable uh, place for us, the job opportunities will be immense. To follow up on that, David, this is a question from Robert Hackett in Vancouver. Um, can we stop a massive bailout of, gas and, of the gas and oil sector and instead get federal government to invest in greener energy and a just transition? Isn't that what we need to address both COVID and climate crisis? What can we do to encourage this approach? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there are a number of uh, groups that have signed saying, if you are going to uh, invest money in the, the tar sands, well, for heaven's sake, make sure that money goes to the workers. Don't just mm -hmm. give it to keep that, the corporations going, but support the workers in that area. And their opportunity lies in using their skills. And there is a group called Iron and Earth that are tar sands workers saying, look, we've got skills. You know, we're pipe fitters, we're drillers, we're truck drivers, we're electricians, we're, we're plumbers. We've got a lot of skills that should be transferable into other areas. Help us, give us the support. And Iron and Earth is asking for uh, support to try to use their skills to install solar panels on all government buildings, libraries, and schools. Well, damn it all, that's where the, the real opportunities lie, it seems to me. It's not about bailing out the oil companies. We can't go on the way we've been going. There was another wonderful piece in the New York Times this morning um, about environmental justice and about coming out of COVID-19, rebuilding the economy, that really building a clean economy is the way to create new jobs and to you know, create a healthy future for people uh, on yeah. an economic level as well as the yeah. climate and the environment. Um, so- there are, two, there are two fundamental problems with the economy as I see it uh, today. One is that the kinds of things that nature does to make the planet habitable to us, we call them ecosystem services, you know, cleansing water, uh, uh, controlling pests, um, uh, you know, dead, composting uh, dead plants and animals, um, providing, ha anyway, there are dozens of ecosystem services well, keep, keep keeping oxygen in the air for us to live, uh, that the economists, when you say, well, if we clear cut this forest, we're going to lose all these ecosystem services. They say, oh, yeah, but that's an externality. That's collateral damage as a result of economic activity, but it's not a part of the economy. So there's where you've got a totally screwed up system to begin with. And then we bought into the idea that economics uh, that the economy must grow 
forever. Now that's the creed of cancer cells is endless growth. Mm, We've constructed wow. a system, economics, built on the creed of cancer in which we ignore the fundamental things that keep us alive. If that isn't a screwed up system, I can't think of one. Uh, and we better turf that thing out and change it. It's a human construct. It's not a force of nature. So let's change the damn thing to make some sense. David, this question is from Brar V. Pasha. The UNO latest report suggests that the only way to flourish in the next ec economy setting should be a welfare state. How do you recommend Canada do so? I guess that's referring to like a universal income. Well, I think it'd be a, a very interesting uh, idea. Of course, this is what the alt-right uses all the time as uh, the, the, this is the underlying uh, goal of all these climatologists and people that are trying to deal with climate change. They want world government so that it can now take over and, and run. This is the uh, argument that's, that's made. I don't know what, you know, a welfare state, but where is the money going to come from? I mean, I, that stuff I don't understand. I certainly think we've got to become, well, let me tell you a story. I, years ago, I, um, when there was a man on the uh, CBC, uh, yeah, John Crispo. John Crispo is an economist at the University of Toronto. And he was on the CBC board of uh, board. And he was saying, saying uh, using that as a springboard to say, if we don't have free trade with the United States, Canada is going to be an economic basket case. You know, and the mm -hmm. whole thing was we had to have, have globalization and free trade and, and all that. So I, said, I met an eminent economist named Kenneth Boulding. And I said, look, these guys are saying that Canada is in danger of becoming an economic basket case. And he said, you know, try this thought exercise. He said, imagine you go to bed and wake up tomorrow and the whole world has disappeared except your country and 200 miles of ocean. Would you starve? Would you, would you lack for energy? Would you lack for the, the uh, human creativity to create whatever you need? Like, by any cri by that cri uh, that that scenario, Canada has got to be one of the wealthiest nations on the planet, and yet here's an economist saying, without globalization and free trade with the United States, we're an economic basket case. What the hell? What kind of an what economy makes, is that? What makes Canada so wealthy, in your view? Well, it's, we've got vast amounts of of land, although most of it is under rock, snow, and ice, but We've, we are a large country with, for that band that's habitable, a large population. We've got all the creativity we need, but we've got uh, the resources and the ability to, to marshal uh, human resources and planetary resources for our use. But, you know, I, I wrote to J uh, John Horgan, the uh, premier of, of uh, BC, and I said, you know, if you're, you're taking climate change very seriously, and I applaud what you're doing in, in many ways, but I said, we can't continue to exist with a food chain that is 6,000 miles long. We're a northern country, and we can't depend on Mexico and California to grow our food in the winter. We've got to have the bread baskets uh, in Canada. And the Peace Valley that they want to flood with a dam at Site C, which they're going to flood, with that dam, that is a fertile area that should be the breadbasket of the North. If you want to deal with climate change, you'd better bloody well be planning for the change that's coming already and that, that we have to live in a different way. We have to depend much more on ourselves and localized, localized food, localized uh, services, localized uh, industry. That's got to be the way we go, much more uh, 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 self-sufficient. I have a question from Catherine King in California in LA. Are there lessons to be learned from the yes, slow, but relatively rapid actions taken to deal with COVID that can apply to climate action? Well, <laughs> yes, absolutely. If we took climate as seriously as the COVID crisis, and quite frankly, in my view, the climate crisis is orders of magnitude greater, a greater threat than is a, the COVID 
uh, uh, crisis because the, the COVID crisis is a crisis for human beings. The climate crisis is a crisis for life on the planet. And uh, uh, I think that, that the important thing is when you are dealing with an issue, you make the commitment to try to, to uh, solve it or, or beat it. And then you pull out all, all stops and the old rules and constraints no longer apply. And that means there are huge opportunities to try new things. I, I met with Jonathan Wilkinson uh, in, in, uh, in Yukon a few months ago, and I said, you know, environmentalists are your people. We're never going to be happy with what you're doing because you'll never do enough. But we have been working year after year with ways of, of making the changes that we feel will help us avoid the climate. Uh, the climate chaos. And you know, you look at people like Guy Doncey in British Columbia, who's got a whole map of how Canada, I think his plan is to be carbon neutral by 2030 or something like that. But there are people that are giving concrete uh, pathways to getting on uh, the way we go. I said to Wilkinson, we're your people, come to us for God's sake. We'll provide you with all the work. We've been doing this for years. We're just waiting for a government that has the guts to seize it and get on with uh, going a different way. Well, they've really shown what they can do when they want to right now. Yes. Um, yes. And you got to tip your hat to them. You know, I've always yeah. said that I, I've always said that Justin Trudeau would make a great governor general. He takes great selfies and he wouldn't have to make any statement, but he's, he's done very well in this crisis. Good for him. My, my hat's off to him. This is a question from Vincent Tan. The rapid spread of COVID in New York City compared to anyone else, anywhere else is blamed on the density of development there. So now can we expect some pushback against eco-density because of this concern? How do we respond to such pushback if we believe that development density encourages ecologically responsible behavior like walking, transit, et cetera? I hadn't thought about that, but I guess there will be that kind of resistance. But uh, what can I say? I think the, uh, the benefits of going that way as we deal with climate change, we'll have to think about ways that we avoid the rapid spread, I suppose, if another one comes up, and there will be another one coming up at some point. We've got to be much better prepared for that. <laughs> but let's face it, we, uh, we are living with populations massive populations now, I don't see any way to avoid greater densification. We can't keep going out and developing more land. We've got to rewild most of the planet. We can't be taking it all over for human use. David, this, story, this um, question is from Bruno DeBont, who is our tech developer, and, um, but it's actually from his partner, Ariane, Kacha Turians, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, whose parents were your students at UBC 50 years ago. Yes, is your dad still alive? <laughs> we'll have to see, hear that answer. The so she, she says, how can we hold politicians who campaign on progressive platforms accountable to their campaign promises after they win? Well, a lot of that, I suppose, depends on uh, whether they get elected with the majority. But uh, as I say, the, I really think the only way we bring about change is with a massive, uh, and we reckon three and a half percent of the population. If we get three and a half percent up and really demanding change and working on it, huge changes are possible. This is the last question I'm going to take from our audience, and then I'm going to wrap up, David. Um, I'm, don't thank you so much for being with us. Um, this is from Kathy Code, and she says, "Government listened to scientists regarding the pandemic. Why don't they listen to scientists regarding climate change?" Well, I, that's a, a great question, and I think it's obvious that when when bodies are are being carted out to the crematorium or the, or mm. the uh, graveyard, uh, mm. you have to respond in a different way to something that we say, oh, well, it's 10 years, 15 years down the line. 
Politicians are simply not able to deal with that. In 1988, the largest gathering of climate scientists uh, at that point met in Toronto. And uh, it was open, 300 scientists, economists, uh, environmentalists met there. And it was opened by Brian Mulroney, who was the prime minister at that time. And then he was followed by Gro Harlem Brundtland, the prime minister of Norway, who had just released the Brundtland report the year before. And they were followed by Jim Hansen, who had just told Congress in the United States that he was 90% sure that the heat wave they were experiencing was caused by human-induced uh, global warming. And he said the same thing in Toronto. And that's when uh, people were, were galvanized. Um, the press release at the end of the conference says, Climate, global warming represents a threat to human survival, second only to uh, a global nuclear war. And that's when they called for a 20% reduction in 1990 levels by the year, uh, in 15 years. Uh, that had a galvanic effect, but then we went into a small recession and the economy always trumps the environment. So over and over again, we've environmentalists have been working on this, raising raising concern and then the economy gets in trouble and boom, you know, and so the economy is in deep trouble now, but it's an opportunity, I think, to say, look, we can't go on just propping up the old economy. We've got to get off in a different uh, direction. I've even forgotten what the question was. <laughs> what was the question? Um, the question was what, li uh, sorry, no. Um, government listened to scientists regarding- Oh yeah, right. The, why won't they listen regarding climate yeah. change? Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's the degree to which the crisis is perceived as real. Mm -hmm. So when there are bodies or blood on the ground, you mm -hmm. react in a different way to a threat that scientists are saying is 20, mm -hmm. uh, 20 years away. Now, mm -hmm. you know, when I started uh, in the early years working on television, scientists were among the highest, res high, most highly respected people uh, in society, scientists, doctors, um, politicians, and business people were absolutely rock bottom. And watching what Trump has done, demonizing scientists, acting as if he is the smartest guy in the room, it's, it's really terrible that scientists have been depicted now as these self-serving people trying to get bigger grants or, or whatever. Any excuse that uh, can be used to keep from actually dealing with the issue that scientists are raising. And I hope, uh, you know, watching Anthony Fauci, Fauci, who I've interviewed many times in the past about uh, HIV AIDS, he is an, a prominent scientist and seeing him up there and gaining so much respect against the rantings of, of Trump. I hope it leads to a kind of a renewed respect for, for facts, for hard information, and for what scientists tell us. We need that. Thank you, David. I have one last question myself for you, which is, you know, this moment is scary for a lot of us and we don't really know how it ends. Um, I'm just wondering, I know you're there with your grandkids. How do you talk to your grandkids about the future? It's a very, very difficult thing because uh, we've had the experience with our own children when we realized when they were young, they were becoming, uh, well, I remember my, my youngest daughter who's with me now, when I said, oh, Sarika, this is a perfect thing for you and your little uh, group of friends to get involved with. She said, why should I? And I said, well, you know, it, it affects you and it's what you can do something about. And she said, I listen to you and mom. I know it's too late. And that we had to go through this thing like, oh my God, we can't keep, keep uh, depressing the children. So we limit ourselves to the extent to which we uh, speak about these issues because uh, we have to give them a sense of hope. And all I can hope is that by us working and trying our best, if children can see mom and dad are worried, but they're working away and they're active, that is the example that they must think there's, they can do something. Mom and dad are there. They're, you know, that's what, 
when I met Greta Thunberg, I said, I am so sorry that you're doing this. I mean, I'm thrilled and, and I, I honor you for what you're doing. But this is what we should be doing. Mom and dad should be out there. You've got a whole world to learn about. You shouldn't be going on and worried about your future. Mom and dad have to set the example by the fact that they're out there doing something. They haven't given up. But I can tell you that among teenagers now, I find uh, uh, parents are telling me they're having to send their, their children for, for help. They're sending them to psychologists because they are taking the message scientists are giving seriously, as is Greta, and feeling, what the hell, you know, I don't have a future. These people that we elect to office, they're not doing anything about my future. Like, uh, so this is where I think mom and dad have to get up and say, we're going to hammer the government and tell them to stop supporting the fossil fuel industry when we should be looking at the, the, the new opportunities in renewable energy. So show your children by what you're doing that you haven't given up. David, it has been such an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. And um, I just want to let everybody know that next week we'll have Noam Chomsky. Oh, great. <laughs> One of my heroes. <laughs> There's no real follow-up for you, David, but um, Noam will be a really interesting interview, too. And um, once again, for everybody on the call, stay safe. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. This is coming Zooming with us, I guess I should say. And I look forward to uh, seeing you next time. And David, I look forward to Thanks seeing you as well. Okay, Thanks. bye. So bye.